Chapter 6 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Snow The 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 6 From Threat to Threat in Chapters 3 and 4, we described how the U.S. government adjusted its existing agencies and capacities to address the emerging threat from Osama bin Laden and his associates. After the August 1998 bombings of the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, President Bill Clinton and his chief aides explored ways of getting bin Laden expelled from Afghanistan, or possibly capturing or even killing him. Although disruption efforts around the world had achieved some successes, the core of bin Laden's organization remained intact. President Clinton was deeply concerned about bin Laden. He and his national security adviser, Samuel Sandy Berger, ensured they had a special daily pipeline of reports feeding them the latest updates on bin Laden's reported location. In public, President Clinton spoke repeatedly about the threat of terrorism, referring to terrorist training camps but saying little about bin Laden and nothing about al-Qaeda. He explained to us that this was deliberate, intended to avoid enhancing bin Laden's stature by giving him unnecessary publicity. His speeches focused especially on the danger of non-state actors and of chemical and biological weapons. As the millennium approached, the most publicized worries were not about terrorism, but about computer breakdowns, the Y2K scare. Some government officials were concerned that terrorists would take advantage of such breakdowns. 6.1. The Millennium Crisis quote, Bodies will pile up in sacks. End quote. On November 30, 1999, Jordanian intelligence intercepted a telephone call between Abu Zubaydah, a longtime ally of bin Laden, and Qadur Abu Hashar, a Palestinian extremist. Abu Zubaydah said, quote, The time for training is over. End quote. Suspecting that this was a signal for Abu Hashar to commence a terrorist operation, Jordanian police arrested Abu Hashar and 15 others and informed Washington. One of the sixteen, Rayed Hijazi, had been born in California to Palestinian parents. After spending his childhood in the Middle East, he had returned to Northern California, taken refuge in extremist Islamist beliefs, and then made his way to Abu Zubaydah's Khaldan camp in Afghanistan, where he learned the fundamentals of guerrilla warfare. He and his younger brother had been recruited by Abu Hashar into a loosely knit plot to attack Jewish and American targets in Jordan. After late 1996, when Abu Hashar was arrested and jailed, Hijazi moved back to the United States, worked as a cab driver in Boston, and sent money back to his fellow plotters. After Abu Hashar's release, Hijazi shuttled between Boston and Jordan, gathering money and supplies. With Abu Hashar, he recruited in Turkey and Syria as well as Jordan. With Abu Zubaydah's assistance, Abu Hashar sent these recruits to Afghanistan for training. In late 1998, Hijazi and Abu Hashar had settled on a plan. They would first attack four targets, the SAS Radisson Hotel in downtown Amman, the border crossings from Jordan into Israel, and two Christian holy sites, at a time when all these locations were likely to be thronged with American and other tourists. Next, they would target a local airport and other religious and cultural sites. Hijazi and Abu Hashar cased the intended targets and sent reports to Abu Zubaydah, who approved their plan. Finally, back in Amman from Boston, Hijazi gradually accumulated bomb-making materials, including sulfuric acid and 5,200 pounds of nitric acid, which were then stored in an enormous sub-basement dug by the plotters over a period of two months underneath a rented house. In early 1999, Hijazi and Abu Hashar contacted Khalil Deek, an American citizen and an associate of Abu Zubaydah, who lived in Peshawar, Pakistan, and who, with Afghanistan-based extremists, had created an electronic version of a terrorist manual, the Encyclopedia of Jihad. They obtained a CD-ROM of this encyclopedia from Deek. In June, with help from Deek, Abu Hashar arranged with Abu Zabeda for Hijazi and three others to go to Afghanistan for added training in handling explosives.
In late November 1999, Hijazi reportedly swore before Abu Zabeda the Bayat to bin Laden, committing himself to do anything bin Laden ordered. He then departed for Jordan and was at a waypoint in Syria when Abu Zabeda sent Abu Hashar the message that prompted Jordanian authorities to roll up the whole cell. After the arrests of Abu Hashar and fifteen others, the Jordanians tracked Deek to Peshawar, persuaded Pakistan to extradite him, and added him to their catch. Searchers in Amman found the rented house and, among other things, seventy-one drums of acids, several forged Saudi passports, detonators, and Deek's encyclopedia. Six of the accomplices were sentenced to death. In custody, Hijazi's younger brother said that the group's motto had been, quote, the season is coming and bodies will pile up in sacks, end quote. On December 4th, as news came in about the discoveries in Jordan, National Security Council, NSC, counterterrorism coordinator Richard Clark wrote Berger, quote, if George's, Tenet's, story about a planned series of UBL attacks at the Millennium is true, we will need to make some decisions now, end quote. He told us he held several conversations with President Clinton during the crisis. He suggested threatening reprisals against the Taliban in Afghanistan in the event of any attacks on U.S. interests anywhere by bin Laden. He further proposed to Berger that a strike be made during the last week of 1999 against al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan, a proposal not adopted. Warned by the CIA that the disrupted Jordanian plot was probably part of a larger series of attacks intended for the millennium, some possibly involving chemical weapons, the Principals Committee met on the night of December 8th and decided to task Clark's Counterism Security Group CSG, to develop plans to deter and disrupt al-Qaeda plots. Michael Sheehan, the State Department Director of the CSG, communicated warnings to the Taliban that they would be held responsible for future al-Qaeda attacks. Quote, Mike was not diplomatic, end quote, Clark reported to Berger. With virtually no evidence of a Taliban response, a new approach was made to Pakistan. General Anthony Zinni, the commander of Central Command, CENTCOM, was designated as the President's Special Envoy and sent to ask General Musharraf to, quote, take whatever action you deem necessary to resolve the bin Laden problem at the earliest possible time, end quote. But Zinni came back empty-handed. As Ambassador William Milam reported from Islamabad, Musharraf was, quote, unwilling to take the political heat at home, end quote. The CIA worked hard with foreign security services to detain or at least keep an eye on suspected bin Laden associates. Tenet spoke to 20 of his foreign counterparts. Disruption and arrest operations were mounted against terrorists in eight countries. In mid-December, President Clinton signed a Memorandum of Notification, MON, giving the CIA broader authority to use foreign proxies to detain bin Laden lieutenants without having to transfer them to U.S. custody. The authority was to capture, not kill, though lethal force might be used if necessary. Tenet would later send a message to all CIA personnel overseas saying, quote, The threat could not be more real. Do whatever is necessary to disrupt UBL's plans. The American people are counting on you and me to take every appropriate step to protect them during this period, end quote. The State Department issued a worldwide threat advisory to its posts overseas. Then, on December 14th, an Algerian jihadist was caught bringing a load of explosives into the United States. Ressam's Arrest Ahmed Ressam, 23, had illegally immigrated to Canada in 1994. Using a falsified passport and a bogus story about persecution in Algeria, Ressam entered Montreal and claimed political asylum. For the next few years, he supported himself with petty crime. Recruited by an alumnus of Abu Zabeda's Kaldan camp, Rassam trained in Afghanistan in 1998, learning, among other things, how to place cyanide near the air intake of a building to achieve maximum lethality at minimum personal risk. Having joined other Algerians in planning a possible attack on a U.S. airport or consulate, Rassam left Afghanistan in early 1999, carrying precursor chemicals for explosives disguised in toiletry bottles, a notebook containing bomb assembly instructions, and $12,000. Back in Canada, he went about procuring weapons, chemicals, and false papers. In early summer 1999, having learned that not all of his colleagues could get the travel documents to enter Canada, Rassam decided to carry out the plan alone. 
By the end of the summer, he had chosen three Los Angeles area airports as potential targets, ultimately fixing on Los Angeles International (LAX) as the largest and easiest to operate in surreptitiously. He bought or stole chemicals and equipment for his bomb, obtaining advice from three Algerian friends, all of whom were wanted by authorities in France for their roles in past terrorist attacks there. Rassam also acquired new confederates. He promised to help a New York-based partner, Abelgani Meschini, get training in Afghanistan if Meschini would help him maneuver in the United States. In December 1999, Rassam began his final preparations. He called an Afghanistan-based facilitator to inquire into whether bin Laden wanted to take credit for the attack, but he did not get a reply. He spent a week in Vancouver preparing the explosive components with a close friend. The chemicals were so caustic that the men kept their windows open despite the freezing temperatures outside and sucked on cough drops to soothe their irritated throats. While in Vancouver, Rassam also rented a Chrysler sedan for his travel into the United States and packed the explosives in the trunk's spare tire well. On December 14, 1999, Rassam drove his rental car onto the ferry from Victoria, Canada to Port Angeles, Washington. Rassam planned to drive to Seattle and meet Moschini, with whom he would travel to Los Angeles, and case LAX. Inset, a case study in terrorist travel. Following a familiar terrorist pattern, Rassam and his associates used fraudulent passports and immigration fraud to travel. In Rassam's case, this involved flying from France to Montreal using a photo-substituted French passport under a false name. Under questioning, Rassam admitted the passport was fraudulent and claimed political asylum. He was released pending a hearing which he failed to attend. His political asylum claim was denied. He was arrested again, released again, and given another hearing date. Again he did not show. He was arrested four times for thievery, usually from tourists, but was neither jailed nor deported. He also supported himself by selling stolen documents to a friend who was a document broker for Islamist terrorists. Rassam eventually obtained a genuine Canadian passport through a document vendor who stole a blank baptismal certificate from a Catholic church. With this document, he was able to obtain a Canadian passport under the name of Benny Antoine Norris. This enabled him to travel to Pakistan and from there to Afghanistan for his training and then return to Canada. Impressed, Abu Zubaydah asked Rassam to get more genuine Canadian passports and to send them to him for other terrorists to use. Another conspirator, Abelgani Moschini, used a stolen identity to travel to Seattle on December 11, 1999, at the request of Mokhtar Hawari, another conspirator. Hawari provided fraudulent passports and visas to assist Rassam and Moschini's planned getaway from the United States to Algeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. One of Moschini's associates, Abdel Hakim Tezega, also filed a claim for political asylum. He was released pending a hearing, which was adjourned and rescheduled five times. His claim was finally denied two years after his initial filing. His attorney appealed the decision, and Tezega was allowed to remain in the country pending the appeal. Nine months later, his attorney notified the court that he could not locate his client. A warrant of deportation was issued. End of inset. They planned to detonate the bomb on or around January 1, 2000. At the Immigration and Naturalization Service INS, pre-inspection station in Victoria, Rassam presented officials with his genuine but fraudulently obtained Canadian passport, from which he had torn the Afghanistan entry and exit stamps. The INS agent on duty ran the passport through a variety of databases, but, since it was not in Rassam's name, he did not pick up the pending Canadian arrest warrants. After a cursory examination of Rassam's car, the INS agents allowed Rassam to board the ferry. Late in the afternoon of December 14th, Rassam arrived in Port Angeles. He waited for all the other cars to depart the ferry, assuming, incorrectly, that the last car off would draw less scrutiny. Customs officers assigned to the port, noticing Rassam's nervousness, referred him to secondary inspection. When asked for additional identification, Rassam handed the customs agent a Price Costco membership card in the same false name as his passport. As that agent began an initial pat-down, Rassam panicked and tried to run away. Inspectors examining Rassam's rental car found the explosives concealed in the spare tire well, but at first they assumed the white powder and viscous liquid were drug-related, until an inspector pried apart and identified one of the four timing devices concealed within black boxes. 
Rassam was placed under arrest. Investigators guessed his target was in Seattle. They did not learn about the Los Angeles airport planning until they re-examined evidence seized in Montreal in 2000. They obtained further details when Rassam began cooperating in May 2001. Emergency Cooperation after the disruption of the plot in Amman, it had not escaped notice in Washington that Hijazi had lived in California and driven a cab in Boston, and that Deke was a naturalized U.S. citizen who, as Berger reminded President Clinton, had been in touch with extremists in the United States as well as abroad. Before Rassam's arrest, Berger saw no need to raise a public alarm at home, although the FBI put all field offices on alert. Now, following Rassam's arrest, the FBI asked for an unprecedented number of special wiretaps. Both Berger and Tenet told us that their impression was that more Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act FISA, wiretap requests were processed during the Millennium Alert than ever before. The next day, writing about Rassam's arrest and links to a cell in Montreal, Berger informed the President that the FBI would advise police in the United States to step up activities, but would still try to avoid undue public alarm by stressing that the government had no specific information about planned attacks. At a December 22nd meeting of the small group of principals, FBI Director Louis Free briefed officials from the NSC staff, CIA, and Justice on wiretaps and investigations inside the United States, including a Brooklyn entity tied to the Rassam arrest, a seemingly unreliable foreign report of possible attacks on seven U.S. cities, two Algerians detained on the Canadian border, and searchers in Montreal related to a jihadist cell. The Justice Department released a statement on the alert the same day. Clark's staff warned, quote, foreign terrorist sleeper cells are present in the U.S. and attacks in the U.S. are likely, end quote. Clark asked Berger to try to make sure that the domestic agencies remained alert. Quote, is there a threat to civilian aircraft, end quote, he wrote. Clark also asked the principals in late December to discuss a foreign security service report about a bin Laden plan to put bombs on transatlantic flights. The CSG met daily. Berger said that the principals met constantly. Later, when asked what made her decide to ask Rassam to step out of his vehicle, Diana Dean, a customs inspector who referred Rassam to secondary inspection, testified that it was her, quote, training and experience, end quote. It appears that the heightened sense of alert at the national level played no role in Rassam's detention. There was a mounting sense of public alarm. The earlier Jordanian arrests have been covered in the press, and Rassam's arrest was featured on network evening news broadcasts throughout the Christmas season. The FBI was more communicative during the Millennium Crisis than it had ever been. The senior FBI official for counterterrorism, Dale Watson, was a regular member of the CSG, and Clark had good relations both with him and with some of the FBI agents handling Al-Qaeda-related investigations, including John O'Neill in New York. As a rule, however, neither Watson nor these agents brought much information to the group. The FBI simply did not produce the kind of intelligence reports that other agencies routinely wrote and disseminated. As law enforcement officers, bureau agents tended to write up only witness interviews. Written case analysis usually occurred only in memoranda to supervisors requesting authority to initiate or expand an investigation. But during the Millennium Alert, with its direct links into the United States from Hijazi, Deke, and Rassam, FBI officials were briefing in person about ongoing investigations, not relying on the dissemination of written reports. Berger told us that it was hard for FBI officials to hold back information in front of a cabinet rank group. After the alert, according to Berger and members of the NSC staff, the FBI returned to its normal practice of withholding written reports and saying little about investigations or witness interviews, taking the position that any information related to pending investigations might be presented to a grand jury and hence could not be disclosed under then prevailing federal law. The terrorist plots that were broken up at the end of 1999 display the variety of operations that might be attributed, however indirectly, to Al-Qaeda. The Jordanian cell was a loose affiliate. We now know that it sought approval and training from Afghanistan, and at least one key member swore loyalty to bin Laden. But the cell's plans and preparations were autonomous. Rassam's ties to al-Qaeda were even looser. Though he had been recruited, trained, and prepared in a network affiliated with the organization and its allies, Rassam's own plans were, nonetheless, essentially independent. Al-Qaeda and bin Laden himself did have at least one operation of their very own in mind for the millennium period. 
In Chapter 5, we introduced an Al-Qaeda operative named Nashiri. Working with bin Laden, he was developing a plan to attack a ship near Yemen. On January 3rd, an attempt was made to attack a U.S. warship in Aden, the USS The Sullivans. The attempt failed when the small boat, overloaded with explosives, sank. The operatives salvaged their equipment without the attempt becoming known, and they put off their plans for another day. Al-Qaeda's, quote, planes operation, end quote, was also coming along. In January 2000, the United States caught a glimpse of its preparations. A Lost Trail in Southeast Asia In late 1999, the National Security Agency, NSA, analyzed communications associated with a suspected terrorist facility in the Middle East, indicating that several members of, quote, an operational cadre, end quote, were planning to travel to Kuala Lumpur in January 2000. Initially, only the first names of three were known, Nawaf, Salem, and Khalid. NSA analysts surmised correctly that Salem was Nawaf's younger brother, seeing links not only with Al-Qaeda but specifically with the 1998 embassy bombings, a CIA desk officer guessed that, quote, something more nefarious was afoot, end quote. In Chapter 5, we discussed the dispatch of two operatives to the United States for their part in the planes operation, Nawaf al-Hamzi and Khalid al-Midhar. Two more, Khalad and Abu Bara, went to Southeast Asia to case flights for the part of the operation that was supposed to unfold there. All made their way to Southeast Asia from Afghanistan and Pakistan, except for Midar, who traveled from Yemen. Though Nawaf's trail was temporarily lost, the CIA soon identified Khalid as Khalid al-Midar. He was located leaving Yemen and tracked until he arrived in Kuala Lumpur on January 5, 2000. Other Arabs, unidentified at the time, were watched as they gathered with him in the Malaysian capital. On January 8th, the surveillance teams reported that three of the Arabs had suddenly left Kuala Lumpur on a short flight to Bangkok. They identified one as Midar. They later learned that one of his companions was named Al-Hazmi, though it was not yet known that he was Nawaf. The only identifier available for the third person was part of a name, Salase. In Bangkok, CIA officers received the information too late to track the three men as they came in, and the travelers disappeared into the streets of Bangkok. The Counter-Terrorist Center, CTC, had briefed the CIA leadership on the gathering in Kuala Lumpur, and the information had been passed on to Berger and the NSC staff and to Director Free and others at the FBI, though the FBI noted that the CIA had the lead and would let the FBI know if a domestic angle arose. The head of the bin Laden unit kept providing updates, unaware at first even that the Arabs had left Kuala Lumpur, let alone that their trail had been lost in Bangkok. When this bad news arrived, the names were put on a Thai watch list so that Thai authorities could inform the United States if any of them departed from Thailand. Several weeks later, CIA officers in Kuala Lumpur prodded colleagues in Bangkok for additional information regarding the three travelers. In early March 2000, Bangkok reported that Nawaf al-Hazmi, now identified for the first time with his full name, had departed on January 15th on a United Airlines flight to Los Angeles. As for Khalid al-Midar, there was no report of his departure, even though he had accompanied Hazmi on the United flight to Los Angeles. No one outside of the counter-terrorist center was told any of this. The CIA did not try to register Midar or Hazmi with the State Department's tip-off watch list, either in January when word arrived of Midar's visa, or in March when word came that Hazmi too had had a U.S. visa and a ticket to Los Angeles. None of this information about Midar's U.S. visa or Hazmi's travel to the United States went to the FBI, and nothing more was done to track any of the three until January 2001, when the investigation of another bombing, that of the USS Cole, reignited interest in Khalad. We will return to that story in Chapter 8. End of Chapter 6.1 Recording by Corey Snow Olympia, Washington HTTP colon slash slash www.cyclameth.com